Starting in 2024, Notre Dame will have a new athletic director for the first time since 2008. Jack Swarbrick is stepping down, Pete Bavacqua is stepping in, and we have a lot to talk about. You are Locked On Irish, your daily podcast on the Notre Dame Fighting Irish. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's going on and welcome to Locked On Irish. It is Friday, June 9th, so happy Friday, everybody. And thank you for making this your first listen of the day. As always, you can watch the show on YouTube or if you're on the go, you can tune in from wherever you get your podcasts. Whether you're watching or listening, it doesn't really matter to me. I'm just grateful you joined me here today. And all I ask is that you please subscribe to the show if you have not already. I'm Tyler Wojcik and I'm the host. I graduated from Notre Dame in 2018 and and have been covering college football as a producer ever since, first for ESPN and most recently at the Fox Sports headquarters in Los Angeles. I've also been podcasting about the football team since 2020, and my old co-host Luke Smith is going to join me here in just a few moments. Normally, Friday episodes are for mailbags or flashback Fridays, but this one is going to be a little bit different because we got some big news on Thursday morning that Notre Dame Athletic Director Jack Swarbrick will be stepping down in the first quarter of 2024, and he'll be replaced by current NBC Sports Chairman Pete Bavacqua. This is a huge deal, not just for Notre Dame, but for collegiate athletics as a whole because Jack Swarbrick has been one of the major power players in the entire industry for some time now. There's so many different layers to this, and I'll continue to talk more about this story on the podcast over the coming weeks and months. But without further ado, let's bring on Luke Smith to react to the news and discuss what this means for the Irish going forward. All right, Luke, we had heard the rumors, um, especially over the past couple of months, but now it's official. Jack Swarbrick will be stepping down as Notre Dame's athletic director in the early part of 2024, and he'll be replaced by NBC Sports chairman Pete Vivacqua. What was your reaction when you heard the news? Wasn't that surprised. Um to be fair, um, I kind of had an inkling that this was coming, just given some things I, I had heard earlier in the day from somebody that may or may not be close to his successor. Um, so that was kind of an inside baseball sort of thing. But, you know, when you consider all the factors and how long Jack Swarbrick has been at Notre Dame, I don't think that it's that shocking that he's stepping down after, you know, almost 20 years at the helm, I think 16 years. And similarly, his successor, I think, fits kind of the mold of your standard Notre Dame athletic director in that he's an alum. Uh, Maybe where he doesn't is that he actually has past experience in sports administration. So that's, uh, I think, a really notable thing and significant thing. But, yeah, I wasn't that surprised. Uh, In other words, I was tipped off. Well, not only that, but it has been a long time. For Swarbrick. Mm-hmm. And if you look at the pictures of him, not going to say that he's aged terribly, but he's certainly aged over the past 16 <laughs> years. And I don't blame him, man. This job is a very, very difficult job. There's a lot of pressure, um, not just from fans like you and I, but also from people with a lot of power, a lot of influence, and a lot of money in their bank accounts. So having to deal with that on a day to day basis was a grind, I'm sure. But 16 years at the helm, I feel like the timing is right, even though it might be a little bit earlier than when his contract is set to run out, which is uh, at the end of the next academic calendar. So at the end of the spring semester in 2024, that's when his contract was set to run out. So it makes sense that Notre Dame is giving him about almost a year's worth of runway before whatever he does next. Right. And we can talk about what that might be. But yeah, that is funny that you bring up just looking at pictures because... (laughs) I actually saw him uh, a couple weeks ago. He was going to pick up pizza at a pizza place I was at in Chicago, and it was a Friday night, and he had jeans on. Give it a on. shout out, dude. Give it all yeah, a it shout was, out. <laughs> yeah, we were sitting on the patio at Rinaldi's, and I, this guy walks up, and I was like, is that Jack Swarbrick? And it was, and he looked spent. Granted, it was at the end of a long work week, um, but yeah, he looked like he he was ready to to retire, um, and to, to some maybe not retire, but this job had had eaten him up a little bit, and um, it, it was on his face clearly that day. Yeah, and he also, at this point in his tenure, he's got all the major sports programs in a pretty good spot right now. Like he just hired Michael Shrewsbury to lead men's basketball, Neil Ivey. And women's basketball is doing a great job. And then, of course, football with Marcus Freeman, a young coach, energetic, seems to love the university, seems to check all the boxes. So he's leaving it in a good place. So the timing of it makes sense. But what other factors do you think went into this decision? Maybe not just for Swarbrick, the university, hell, even his replacement. Why do you think it's, why do you think it's happening now here uh, as we sit here today on June 8th? 
Well, as you just said, he also just won a national title too in lacrosse. So, I mean, I guess what better time than any to to go out than after winning a national title? I think that there are some pressing issues, both relative to irrelevant to Notre Dame and college athletics at large, that perhaps require a fresh set of eyes or somebody that's not at the twilight of their career. And and I think there's probably some understanding from Swarbrick on that end that. Some fresh perspective could be helpful. And and as for what those issues I'm referring to are, well, one, Notre Dame's own um, issues with their NBC deal, which I'm sure this is, they've probably never been more in bed with NBC than now uh, after bringing in the chairman uh, of NBC to be their athletic director, but also the apparel deal and, and what might you know, be next there and, and bringing somebody in who has that media experience and experience with the PGA working with a bunch of different sponsors. I think that that's critical as well. And and also, of course, as it pertains to college athletics, NIL. And I think you even saw this in Jack Swarbrick's comments today. I forget what the exact verbiage was, but he said something about the line, something along the lines of it's, a very disruptive time in college athletics and there's a lot of swarming issues and, and you probably need somebody who has some fresh perspective on that and can come in and, and try to apply their ideas and, and perspective there. So I think that there's probably a desire both from Notre Dame's side to bring somebody into the fold who might be able to bring new ideas to the table and also an understanding from Swarbrick's side that I don't really want to deal with all these issues right now. Yeah, I actually think the first time I heard about Swarbrick considering retiring or stepping down, whatever you want to call it, was actually pre, or maybe it was during COVID, like in the peak of the pandemic in 2020. And I think that was a big time where he was sort of on his way out, maybe mentally. And then COVID happens. He's got to deal with all that, getting Notre Dame to play a football season that year. And then with that came the evolution of the transfer portal and sort of guiding Notre Dame through all of that. So I actually think he's been thinking about doing this for years. And now he feels that he's probably, this is about as calm as it's going to get at Notre Dame right now before all the stuff that you just mentioned. He really has to make some tough decisions. So I, I think right now in June of 2023, this is probably a good time for him to be like, I'm going to step down. Totally. And let's also be honest here. The Marcus Freeman thing, right? Uh, I mean, who knows? I think we're all optimistic that this is going to improve in year two and, and beyond. But what if it doesn't? You probably don't want to be there to be the guy to pull the plug on that either. <laughs> um, so like, I, I'm sure that that's not the guiding force, but that has to be a factor too just because of the uncertainty surrounding that. Right. The fact that he's leaving all three programs with a pretty strong face right now is important. But um, I know that some Notre Dame fans uh, don't have the same level of respect and admiration for Swarbrick as I do. And I wonder if he had not made this decision just a few months after the whole Andy Ludwig offensive coordinator search debacle, how different today would be and how the fan reaction to him stepping down would be. But for the most part, I thought he was excellent as an athletic director. Sure, he did make some mistakes along the way, and there were times where I was critical of him. But I think overall, he was really good for Notre Dame and the university and really was just a major player in college athletics. So how will you look back on his tenure? Pretty fondly, I would say. There was a ton of success achieved underneath him. If you look at football specifically, um, hired Brian Kelly, and who really got Notre Dame back on the ra- right track after kind of 20 years almost of just wandering in the desert of mediocrity. Um, under Kelly, you go to two college football playoffs and play for a national title in another year. I think that's pretty significant. I know that you want to win a national title, but they came about as close to that as you possibly can without actually doing it. A bunch of other national titles in, in other sports. You got women's basketball, lacrosse, um, women's soccer, the fencing, dynasty that's the fencing school. team. <laughs> yeah. And then you got a couple of frozen fours and national title appearances for hockey. You got, I mean, he hired Link Jarrett who got Notre Dame to the college world series in baseball. I think that was a pretty good hire. Um, a lot, a lot of really strong hires, I would say. And I think we really like what he's, what Micah Shrewsbury and, and Neil Ivy have in place for the basketball programs. And outside of that, I mean, he's often been credited as the, brainchild behind campus crossroads which really just transformed that entire campus it did uh we were there for it as it occurred and as it kind of was being built and unfolded and it made that place 
a million times better. Like, honestly, as soon as that thing was built, I was kind of like, where did people hang out on campus before this thing was built? Because it just changed everything hanging out in that Duncan student center. Um, and it, it was true. It wasn't just a football move. Like the entire student body got utility out of that thing. So oh, yeah. I give him a ton of credit for that. And also always got Notre Dame a seat at the table as, as far as it pertains to the college football playoff. He was one of the chief architects of this 12 team playoff, which I know some people had some gripes with, but he still made sure that Notre Dame had a seat there and, and, it, through that, Notre Dame was able to maintain its independence. And it's really that work that he did with the college football playoff and its future format that makes me think it's hard for me to see this guy just totally walking away from collegiate athletics. Uh, and I'm interested to see what he does next because I think there's some opportunities there in a sport that really lacks legislation or uh, you know a governing body whatsoever. Yeah, without a doubt. And I want to get to that, but I also want to list off a couple of his notable accomplishments while we're on the topic. Um, you mentioned the Brian Kelly thing. Brian Kelly, I think for as much as Notre Dame fans might dislike the way that he left, you can't argue with the fact that he really put some life into the football program that it desperately needed. And it, and Swarbrick's predecessor, Kevin White, gave Charlie Weiss a 10-year contract for a bad loss, or excuse me, a good loss against USC. And so it's easy to look back in hindsight and be like, oh, wow, Notre Dame hired the Irish Catholic guy from Boston. Of course they did. That, that was such an easy hire. If it was such an easy hire, they probably would have made some better ones prior to him, but they didn't. So I, that was good. And also the decision to retain him after 2016, I think it would have been easy for him to look elsewhere, which would have been a bad move. And we saw the five-year run that Notre Dame went on after that horrible 2016 season. So I think that was a smart move. He also had that great line when he walked into his press conference and he said uh, he was late because he was reading The Observer after some old alums called for him to be fired. I thought that was a highlight of his career, even if it wasn't a good time. Uh, I thought that was a good joke. And uh, this, the 2020 college football season, not just for Notre Dame, I think he saved that entire season because a lot of teams held the Big Ten was going to shut everything down. And then Swarbrick was like, no, we're playing and we're going to find a way. And then once Notre Dame made that decision, all the dominoes started to fall. And I don't think he gets enough credit for that. I would love to ask him, like in a closed room, did you just realize how good Notre Dame was going to be that season? And you're like, no, no, we can't let this go to waste. We got to play this damn season. Like if Notre Dame, if he looked at the roster, he's like, man, we're looking at a five and seven team. Would he have been so aggressive in playing the season? I don't know. But I feel like those are a couple more things that we need to mention because uh, I think he was a really important figure, not just for Notre Dame, but for college athletics. And that's just another example. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that literally was the reason that that 2020 season got played while Kevin Warren, who, again, Notre Dame degree, but is now trying to move the Bears to Naperville, wanted to cancel that entire season uh, while well, he was commissioner of the Big Ten. So, yes, props to Jack for that as well, because that season was really kind of like, I don't know how to put this, the only shining light in an otherwise like really dark period of time. So, yeah, that was uh, that was critical. This episode of Lockdown Irish is brought to you by Bird Dogs. I've raved about Bird Dog shorts before on the podcast, and I'm here to do it again because they're just that good. Not only do they make you look better, they're way more comfortable than regular shorts that are made of a stiff, restricting cotton. Bird Dogs fix this issue by inventing cloud knit fabric that looks just like khaki, but stretches so you get a way slimmer fit without having to sacrifice movement. So not only can you wear these shorts to the gym, but you can wear them on the golf course, out to lunch, really, wherever you want. Not only that, when you go to birddogs.com slash college and enter promo code college, they'll throw in a free Yeti-style tumbler with your order. That's birddogs.com slash college for a free Yeti-style tumbler. So get to birddogs.com ASAP, get yourself some new shorts and a nice coffee tumbler to go along with them, and once your shorts arrive, you won't want to take them off. That's a promise. What's next for him, do you think? You've already kind of alluded to it. I... I don't think he's done either. Now, he's going to be 70 years old here pretty soon, so I don't think he's going to take on another huge position. But it's hard for me to imagine a guy who's been so involved in so many major things in college athletics. He's got his fingerprints all over. I mean, the 12-team playoff, you mentioned it earlier. He basically secured Notre Dame's independence, uh, or at least made it more secure than it's been in a while because now with the at-large bids, like Notre Dame's got a spot there every single year, even if he did forfeit. Uh, the chance at a buy, which we, you know, that's a topic for another day. But I feel like he's sort of branched out beyond just Notre Dame, and he's more invested specifically in college football. Like, I think he's a football guy, and I'm basing that off of how active he's been in the sport. So I don't think he's done. 
I don't either. And this is a super half-baked idea that I had just kind of biking home from work tonight. But like I said, college football doesn't really have a governing body. Nobody's in charge, and that's why it's a mess. The NCAA has just kind of given up on legislating it. Who's to say you can't become, I don't know what you want to call it, like the czar of college football? Now, I do think that the age, uh, obviously, that is a major project, and you're right. Maybe he's not that interested in taking that on. But I actually think I heard somebody suggest this for Mike Bray in college basketball when he stepped down. Uh, of course, he's with the Hawks now, but just like somebody that you know has some integrity and is going to be able to establish where I actually don't know if Mike Bray would have been that great in that role, uh, just because I don't know how much he would have cared. But given Jack's you know legal background and administrative sports administration background, this could be a fit. Now, would anybody actually ever agree to to have in this position? That's an entirely different conversation. But if that if there ever was a time for one and there ever was a person to fill that role, I think you might have it right here. I I see it. I don't know if college football would ever appoint you called a czar. Mm -hmm. I'd say maybe commissioner. I don't know yeah. if they'd ever actually do it. But Swarbrick right. has demonstrated that he knows how to influence people in the sport. I mean, he was right next to uh, Greg Sankey, the SEC commissioner, where they were making that 12-team playoff. So maybe he doesn't have as much of like a frontward-facing role, but I could still him see him like working in the shadows. Still, He's still in the mix, even if he just doesn't have uh, a label attached to his name anymore. Totally. And maybe that's just like kind of in some sort of advising role. And, and I, I don't like... I mean, they still have the college football uh, playoff committee and they have the chairperson. That's kind of just to me just seems like a facey thing where it's yeah, not like I don't think do that. actually anything there. But if there's an elevated sense of that, maybe that makes sense. I don't know. I agree. I think if he does that, it's just because he's bored. But um, what do you think this means for Father Jenkins? Unfortunately for him, I don't think it means anything. Um, I think he's wanted to get out for quite some time now, to be honest. And in fact, I think I've heard this for yeah. like since I was in college. The problem is Notre Dame doesn't have anybody to replace him. Uh, I don't know if people are aware of this, but essentially one of the requirements or the requirements to being the president of the University of Notre Dame are you have to be a priest and you have to have a PhD. And he's currently like the only guy on staff in Notre Dame that fits that. Uh, there was a president, there was a priest at Notre Dame by the name of um, Father Sean McGraw, who was actually in residence in my dorm at, in Morrissey Hall, and he decided to leave the priesthood. He would have fit this role perfectly. I think they were grooming him for uh, to be Jenkins' successor. But when he left the priesthood in 2016, that kind of threw a wrench in things, and that's why you still have Father John up there because I think he's been looking to retire for quite some time now. Yeah, he's getting a little old, too. Uh, he's 69 years old as well. He's been the president since 2005, which makes sense because it does seem like he's been around for a long time. But when you really go back and look at it, you're like, wow, man, he's been the president for a long time. I've heard that, too, that he's wanted to get out. Not that he's, like, desperately trying to, but just sort of to, you know, take a little bit of responsibility away from him because that's another very demanding job, highly ridiculed. So I think the, the initial plan was probably for Swarbrick, Jenkins and how even Mike Bray, because his contract is supposed to go out or run out in the end of uh, 2024 as well. I think they were all planning on sort of going out together. Swarbrick's gone. I've got to imagine that Jenkins is trying to get out, but I'm with you. I, I don't know who would be a potential successor to him, but I would hope that if he's been trying to leave for five or six years, one name has popped up that's a worthy candidate. You would think, but yeah, the... I don't know. Just like they're an interesting bunch of people at Notre Dame that make these decisions. So I haven't heard anything, but yeah, I would think that the end is near. Um, and I would think that he would want that to be the case. Yeah, I agree. All right, let's talk about the new man in charge, Pete Bavacqua. He graduated from Notre Dame in 1993. He was a walk-on punter for Lou Holtz's squad and has been the chairman for NBC Sports since 2020 after serving as president for the previous two years. He also spent six years as the CEO of the PGA of America. And personally, I love the hire. Uh, he's been around the university and the football program in particular for a very long time, and that's important. And by all accounts, the guy lives and breathes Notre Dame. So how do you feel about this move? 
I think it's a great move, just given that he has a ton of experience in the world of sports and media. Um, like you mentioned, having been with NBC Sports the last several years and then with the PGA prior to that. And I do think that that Notre Dame tie is is really significant here. Um, and, and frankly, as you kind of start to read some quotes about him, there's a little bit about this that kind of reminds you of Marcus Freeman a little bit. Uh, I mean, he is he's not quite as young as Freeman, but he's in his, I think, early 50s, right? I know he has a couple young kids. Um, he's young for this role, school. I would say. Yes. And if you look at his quotes about the role, it just it kind of gives you that same sense that you get when you hear Marcus Freeman talk about Notre Dame. There's one in particular I saw where he said, this is a dream come true with the exception of my family. Nothing means more to me than Notre Dame. I don't have a memory in my lifetime, quite literally, where Notre Dame wasn't a part of it at this stage in my life. I feel like everything I've done has prepared me for this. And then there's the end of this quote is I didn't have a burning desire necessarily to be an athletic director. I had a burning desire to be the athletic director at Notre Dame, which I think is pretty significant. Um, and I think that if you look at what he was doing in some sense, this honestly could be like a step a down almost. Yeah. yeah <laughs> Dude, like, I, totally. I was thinking the same thing. I was actually talking to my roommate about him today and he's like, Oh, what's his background? And I was explaining. I was like, yeah, CEO of PJ of America. And then he was the president of NBC sports. And now he's the chairman. And then he sort of stopped for a second. He's like, and now he wants to be an athletic director. He's like, that seems like a bad career move. And I was like, you're probably right, but that's a good yeah. thing for Notre Dame because it means he's just that invested in this job. Right. And that's kind of what I, the connection I'm trying to make or the parallel I'm trying to draw to, to the enthusiasm that Marcus Freeman seems to have for Notre Dame. I think you see that come through here. Obviously went to school there, like grew up there. I think I saw a quote saying, the only school he ever applied to was Notre Dame. And this is probably the only job he would leave for um, that wasn't somehow bigger than chairman of NBC. So I think that that's pretty notable, especially as you enter a period of time where there are a lot of, there's a lot of uncertainty surrounding the future of college athletics. I also want to give the people uh, a little glimpse into the type of person he is. This is from Harrison Latham, his nephew. And I asked him in, in advance if I could share this on the show. He said, it's cool. He said that, he loves nothing more than sitting on his porch in Maine with a cigar and a nice cocktail talking about the Irish. So honestly, he sounds like one of us. So that's good to see. Now he's the athletic director. He's going to be calling the shots. But now let's say hypothetically, okay, Bavakwa were to reach out to us and ask for our advice about the first things he should do as the athletic director at Notre Dame. Maybe he's been a fan since the Suns days, and he's like, these dudes just get it. Uh, he wouldn't be wrong, by the way. We actually were both candidates for the position, and we turned it down. But what would you tell him? Well, outside of parking, which is probably outside <laughs> of his purview, uh, the, honest answer the, here, the honest answer here is finding a way to make it more difficult for opposing fans to get into Notre Dame stadium. Like think about that Cincinnati debacle, the Georgia debacle. They did a pretty good job last year when they played Clemson. Granted the, the weather wasn't that Ohio nice. Ohio State debacle. Well, and that's actually interesting that you say that because I think it was Pete Sampson who, I don't remember how long ago this was. Might've been a couple of weeks, a couple of months ago. He teased to some effect. It might've been in his mailbag. Somebody asked about this and he said he was working on a story about how the athletic department was working on this to make it more difficult and make sure there wasn't a takeover. So if that's still a story out there, Pete, please write it. I'm interested to see what you may have found and what they're working on, but I, I'm serious. I do think that that should be a, a priority to, as it pertains to football specifically now, as it pertains to the athletic department at large, I, you have to find ways to continue to enhance these NIL programs and, and opportunities that Notre Dame athletes have. Um, I think that given his background, there's a lot of opportunity there, and I'm really excited to see how that may take off. Um, but those are kind of the two first things that come to mind just off the top of my head. I agree. The connection to NBC, I think there's a plethora of opportunities there, especially for any athletes who want to get in the media space. Uh, for example, Kyle Hamilton's podcast that was with the volume, they made a bunch of money off that and it was good. And like, I think if you utilize the resources that NBC has, um, there's plenty of opportunities there. I've got a couple, I got some notes here. Okay. Number one, start selling beer at football games. Yep. Good idea. I, I think that's, that should be at the top. Um, this one might be a little bit more aggressive. Find out who on the board or who is impeding progress on the Goog. 
find out their names, get a list, and then hire a personal investigator and blackmail them so we can get the gook up. <laughs> okay. Enhance the gook a little bit. Um, ditch Under Armour for Nike. Get Michigan back on the football schedule. And I realize all of this has to do with football, but then I second your NIL take. Uh, those are just a few things at the top of my list. Um, maybe he doesn't have to go to the personal investigator route. Maybe he could just say, I think get this we done. should update the gook and they get it done. Yeah. Uh, but I, I, I do think, in all, in all seriousness, that the Goog update and just figuring out the NIL thing and just staying ahead, or at least for as much as Notre Dame can, because they're always going to be a little bit behind. We get that. But can we not fall too far behind? Because I think that's what happened. Right, exactly. And ideally here, you've got somebody leading the charge that's been on the forefront of major professional sports leagues and one of the major you know, broadcast networks in the world. So I think that you should have somebody who has that level of, of innovative thought who can lead, you know, to more disruptive ways uh, of creating an, an advantage for these the athletes at Notre Dame. So I'm just really excited to see what that looks like. Um, but I, I, I'm sure also there's probably a bit of a learning curve just because even though, You've worked in sports administration, never been an athletic director before. Jack Swarbrick had never been an athletic director before either, though. So um, I don't know that that's necessarily a huge deal, but just like with anything, and especially with anything at Notre Dame, there's a little bit of a learning curve to it. Yeah, so on that note, what do you think are the biggest challenges he's going to face once he takes full control of the job next year? I think... Honestly, I think NIL is one of them um, just Definitely. because of the rate that it's exploding at across the country. And like, additionally, I, I think that this is probably some really sound foresight from Notre Dame by bringing somebody in from NBC, because there have been a lot of fears and I'm not the first person to talk about this, that basically like college football is going to become like an ESPN league and a Fox league with conference realignment and all this stuff. And you need somebody to understand how all those inner work, who understands how all those inner workings um, work in, in charge just to kind of make sure you have a seat at the table, so to speak. But even having that, that's just kind of scary for the outlook of, of football. And basically like, I think you'd be could looking at a situation where college football teams almost operate outside of the body of universities and I don't know if Notre Dame fits within that vision. In fact, I don't think they do, but like, I think that's the prospect you're staring at right now. And you need somebody steady to, to kind of guide that and be in those conversations. So we don't get to that point. Yeah, I agree. And I think that's certainly a trend going on in the college athletics world. I mean, big 10 just hired Tony Petiti, who was running the MLB network for a long time. He has plenty of media experience. Um, Bowlesby, I think, uh, Brett Yormark. Yeah. Brett, Brett Yormark. That's right. Bullsby was the previous one. And then now Notre Dame adding uh, Pete Bavacqua, who was the chairman of NBC Sports. I think it makes sense. Like the media world and the sports world, they're so in bed with each other and they're so integral now that I think it was very important to have someone with that media savvy to run the show here at Notre Dame. And it leads me to my next question is, do you think that this – or how do you think this impacts Notre Dame's independence in football? Because personally, I think as long as that relationship with NBC is strong and NBC is willing to pay Notre Dame close to the amount that the Big Ten and the SEC teams are getting so that they can keep up in the arms race, I think as long as that happens, Notre Dame's independence is fine. But once that gap, once that gap gets too big, then I think Notre Dame's going to have to make a decision to join a conference because you can't be willing to lose out on – you know, tens of millions of dollars every single year. Cause eventually that's going to add up and you're going to be way behind. Yeah. I've kind of thought that they would join the big 10 within the next five to 10 years, regardless, to be honest. Um, and I can't really explain why that is. It's just kind of a feeling I have just the way things are going, but I think you're right. Um, if they are able to negotiate a price where they're not falling too far behind, then that could help them cling to their independence. But I just, I kind of see us getting to a place where those, especially the Big Ten and the SEC blow up so much that you kind of have to make a choice and join it. Um, and regardless of whatever the nature of the relationship with NBC is, and especially now at the end, that NBC has a relationship with the Big Ten, I wonder what that would look like, um, you know, but I, I just kind of have a feeling they're going to join the Big Ten regardless in the next five to 10 years, but that's just me. 
It certainly could happen. And now Pete Bavacqua, he's going to be working with Tony Petiti. He's going to be working with these other commissioners now because that's how it worked with Swarbrick. But there's a lot of meat left on this bone, but I think we've covered it for today. So, Luke, thanks as always for the time, and uh, I'll talk to you soon, bro. Sounds good. Thank you. All right, that's a wrap for this episode of Locked On Irish. Thanks again to Luke, and thanks to you for making this your first listen of the day. On the way out, remember to subscribe to the show from wherever it is that you're tuning in from, and give us a follow on Twitter, at Locked On Irish, on Instagram, at Locked On Irish Pod, and my personal Twitter account, at Tyler Wojak. That's at Tyler, W-O-J-C-I-A-K. Enjoy the weekend, everybody, and I'll see you on Tuesday of next week.